live in an increasingly polarized world with people isolated in their filter bubbles or echo chambers or divided into hostile or even wiring camps. We speak, for instance, in the Philippines of the 31 million versus the 15 million, of Imperial Manila versus the rest of the country, of Christians versus Muslims, of liberals versus illiberal Democrats. The litany of divides goes on and on. But there are examples of conflicting groups who have successfully depolarized, who have managed to bridge their differences in the aftermath of actual conflict. What can we learn from them? Good evening. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. One of the highlights of the 2022 Asian Conference on Political Communication was a provocative presentation on depolarization. I'm happy to say that that very presenter is with us tonight. Dr. Abdul Roman is a lecturer and researcher at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology Saigon campus in Vietnam, specializing in social movements. His book, Conflict, Continuity, and Change in Social Movements in Southeast Asia is forthcoming from Rootledge. He joins us from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Welcome, Dr. Roman, and thank you for joining us in the public square. Thank you for having me on, John. Thank you, Dr. Roman, or if I may, I'll call you Abdul. Let me start. Our focus tonight is on depolarization, how to bridge the divides in our society. But to reach your conclusions, you had to study two social movements in Indonesia in depth. Can we begin with a basic question of framework? You used the theory of social movement episodes. Why did you use this approach and how did that approach help you understand social movements in a deeper way? Yeah, so I was looking at a conflict society actually and how a group of people uh, were trying to promote peace in a post-conflict society during and after the conflict. So when I was um, looking at, let's say, a group of young people um, trying to let's say, uh, promote peace in a conflict zone. The, the context was in Indonesia. Um, we were thinking about what happened after the conflict ends. What, what are this group of youths um, doing after the conflict ended? So what we found back then was that they do not stop making or promoting peace. Um, because after the conflict, people become very, very polarized. In the context of Amban Indonesia, the polarization stems from religions because the conflict was originating from uh, communal conflicts between the, the Christian and Muslim communities. So I started from there. Uh, in your uh, presentation in Singapore, you also spoke of uh, tribes. You said that any given society uh, rather that all humans are inherently tribal. What does that mean? And what does it imply, this tribalness? First for social movements, and then second for our use of social media. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm glad that you brought that up um, because put it this way, we are inherently tribal. We love our, we love people who look like us. We love people who, um, let's say they are speaking the same language as us. Like for example, um, whenever I'm traveling, I ran into um, a group of Filipinos, for example, and then I just spontaneously uh, try to speak with them because many of them thought that I look like Filipinos and I kind of um, enjoy hanging out with Filipinos because they are kind of like fun and also we share the same jokes. Right before talking with you today, I was speaking with a friend in Manila, actually. So when I'm talking about, when I'm saying that we are inherently travel, we are, um, we tend to be attracted to people who look like us. For example, if you are Asians, most Asians like to hang out with other Asians, most Muslims 
and most Christians and other people from different religions hang out with other people from 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 from, from the same religions. Um, so that's what I meant by tribal. But put it this way, our tribalism is not necessarily bad because that offers us comfort. Imagine something like this. If you mm -hmm. know a person from, let's say, Indonesia, and you speak Indonesia, you grew up in Indonesia, like where I'm from, um, then you just want to speak in your first language. You want to speak with people who understand your jokes. You want to speak or van out with people that, you know, you don't really need to put effort because they understand you because you share the same uh, cultural backgrounds and, and, and point of references. So that I meant by tribal tribalisms, but again, that offered comfort. However, these days our tendency to be tribal has been exploited by many people. We don't really know them. Sometimes we know them. Sometimes we don't really know them. Um, but those in power tend to exploit our tribalisms in order to gain power. This kind of tendency then being exacerbated by um, social media the algorithm and then and then the echo chambers and stuff like that we all know that but the thing is, is we need to be aware and we need to be aware and consciously know that, that we are a tribal and again tribalism is not necessarily bad mm -hmm. sticking around with your people is not always bad that is a source of support but once we know that that tribalism it started being exploited that is where we need to again double check why it happens who really benefited from um, the exploitations of our tribalisms abdul um i have a question about choice uh, tribal identity is it a matter of choosing the tribes that we belong to or is it also a matter of circumstance we we are born into these tribes and if it's both, can, can we talk about the difference? Hmm. Yeah, so for example, when I'm speaking with, um, let's say, the generations who grew up in a conflict, let's say the conflict in the nations between the Muslim and Christians. When mm -hmm. I was asking them, let's say, um, so how do you see your family clans? Because they share the last name, they share the same religion and stuff like that. If they were born Muslim, in a, if they were born to a Muslim family, then they automatically become Muslim. So in that sense, do they have a right to choose? Well, when you were a kid, you don't really have access to choosing what religion you want to embrace. But as you grow up, you have the chance to choose um, your friends. You have chance to choose your religion and other things that you believe reflect your identity better. So to answer your questions, I would say it's kind of mixed. But when we think about our tendency to defend our own tribe, it's not new. It's been there for a long time. It's been there since we, I don't know, we were born. Um, but again, what we don't really know is how can we manage our tendency to be tribal in a good way, in a positive way. So it, it, it will sort of give us a, a, a shield from being uh, exploited by those in power. I'm going to give you another example. When conflict happened in Amman, Indonesia, most people believe that oh, our religion is something that's going to teach us to become a better person. Our religious congregations is our source of support. If you, for example, need to borrow money, you borrow money from people and from the same con uh, congregations. If you want to find out after, let's say, breaking up with your partners, then you can talk with them. But then, the politics involved. For example, back then, back in 1999, um, Indonesia was kind of in a political turmoil. And then those in power want to shift the issue from the national politics into a lower level. So to some extent, the Andonis back then believed that the conflict was created. How it was created? It's by, by exploiting the identity, the religious identity and the ethnicity of the Andonis people. If, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that we are vulnerable to uh, manipulation, not because we are religious, but because our uh, religious impulse um, 
can be manipulated by uh, leaders, political leaders, uh, uh, and, and so on. In other words, um, those who want to seize power, for instance, or uh, foment a conflict, um, use a tribal identity as a way to uh, sharpen a divide. It, it, am I getting this? There, there is a difference between the religion that we belong to and uh, uh, vulnerability uh, that we are open to because we are religious. Yeah, yeah. I think the easiest way to think, to think or to explain about that is let's borrow the terminology as identity politics. Identity okay. politics. It might involve your political affiliations. It might involve your religious identity. It might involve your sexual identity and other kind of identities that you have. Um, we all have this this identities, and identity is not one dimensional. It is multi multiple. Uh, it's multi dimensional. Like for example, if you see people in the conflict, they probably believe that Islam was the religion that they embraced since they were little, and so it is. It is true. There is no, you know, there is not much room to criticize Islam back then. The same thing also applies to Christianity. It's, it's. We don't really have much room to fall back, but. But again, since we see religions or other form of identity as part of our self, as part of our tribe, then this is something that many people are saying. I'm not going to name names, like people who want to seek power, they're just going to exploit it. So we just need to be aware of our tribal identity and how to manage it. You also, in your research, uh, use the concept of the small world, which I find very interesting. Uh, what is that? Can you walk us through it? And how can we apply that concept of the small world uh, to our own respective mm. situation? Yeah, it's it linked back to the idea of tribalism, actually. So, so small world, there are so many definitions of small world, but the way I'm seeing it is that we like our world to be small because it's our comfort, it's our, our peace, it is easy to manage, it's routine, it's normal. So how it plays out? Again, if we stick to our routine, we stick to our tribe, it makes our life easier. It is, it is a source of support. So that is the main idea of small world. However, within the small world, there is also social norm. There is also social identity that we need to navigate. So when it comes to, let's say, depolarizations, we need to know in which small world do we belong. So if we know that we belong to this small world, so we kind of know, oh, the other people were, were part of the other small world. Can we make our small world talk to each other. So that is something that I was exploring. And if it comes, and the bridge for doing that is by sharing information. I'm going to give an example of what happened in, um, in one of my observations in Indonesia. So it was in 2016 or 17. Uh, so since 2017, I was doing my field work and I was essentially hanging out at a cafe. So I didn't intend to research about cafes in a post-conflict society or in a polarized society. No, that was not my intention. So then I was, I was writing uh, my memos, my field, my field note and stuff like that. Then I ended up talking with people different religions. Let's say I went to, um, I went to the northern part of Ambon. Then I find, oh, this area is kind of identical to the Christians. And then, and the opposite area is identical um, with the Muslims. When I was sitting at one of the cafes, I saw people from different small worlds in this context, religion, mm -hmm. norms, and stuff like that. They kind of interacting with one another. They navigate the, the differences. They know, hey, you are a Christian, I'm a Muslim, um, but we are here not to talk about our conflict experiences. I'm seeing you as a human being. I'm seeing you as a person that can be kind to me and I'll be kind to you. 
So that was what I was observing back then in Ambon as a post-conflict society. How that can link to, for example, polarized society that we have seen these days. Because we are to focus on our own identity rather than trying to see the bigger identity. We are to focus on our individual identity rather than think about our social and collective identity. I, I find this very fascinating. Uh, I teach a course on media and politics and we take up Habermas, uh, whose uh, discovery of the concept of the public sphere is based on discovering that people gathered together uh, hundreds of years ago in coffee shops and salons and pubs. Um, also, I think this is related to your concept of uh, the third place, third places uh, as, as, as an important um, uh, part or step in depolarizing. But before we get to that exciting part, I, I just wanna uh, make sure I, I don't skip a step. Um, can we talk about the role of social media and digital media? We're, we're talking about we are all inherently tribal. You know, one way of looking at, at all of this is that uh, is through the prism of identity politics. No, we're looking at small worlds getting or connecting to each other. Uh, how does our use of digital and social media complicate uh, our sense of uh, tribalness? our identity politics. Mm. Yeah, I have to be fair. I have to be fair if it comes to the use of digital and social media platforms, because put it this way. Um, back in 2011, when the conflict in Ambon happened, there were several people who actively used social media for promoting peace. So social media in this sense, the use of social media in this sense was good. Okay, so we have to also acknowledge that part as well. But, but um, these days we see that social media, you know, it becomes our enemy, quote unquote. It gives us a lot of headache these days. Um, what's happened in Myanmar, what happened in different parts of Indonesia, it stems from, uh, some violence stems from social media. But I would like to say that it is not fair to put the blame solely on social media. Just like tribalisms, our tendency um, to engage in violence has been around for a long time. We have witnessed the tribal wars. We have witnessed uh, communal conflicts in many different parts of the world. Social media amplify them. Social media facilitates many different things, many bad things to happen after many good things happen. I'm gonna give you an example. During the conflict, in Ambon at least, it's kind of resembled what happened in Myanmar uh, when, let's say, Facebook um, didn't content moderate um, some hateful content in, in, in circulating on so, in, in Myanmar, in Myanmar social media. Back in 2011, in Ambon, the same thing also happened. However, the people of Amban back then was actively moderating the content. How did they do that? They were actively counteracting the hateful content spread by different religious groups. And because Amban was a very small city, they know each other, they, they know uh, where they live, so where they, where, 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 you know, the place they live. And then when one person, one Facebook user residing in Ambon, spreading, let's say, fake news, spreading misinformation, disinformation, and also and hateful content, they just speak to them. You need to, you need to provide more explanation. You need to take it down by yourself because what you are sharing is not good for our society. So that is something that we do not really have these days. Um, our ability to know our neighbors, our ability to build relationships with the other uh, small world, the other member of small words, our ability to listen to the other tribes. I think we've reached a point. I think we've uh, we've done the necessary uh, groundwork. I can now ask you the main question: How can society depolarize? 
Okay, I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest. <laughs> what I can think of is um, based on what I saw, based on what I saw in Ambon. Again, I'm using Ambon as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example because the city has experienced years of violence conflicts between Muslim and Christian. And now they are, they can be categorized, uh, it, it can be categorized as the, um, as the post-conflict society. Mm -hmm. And post-conflict society, living in a post-conflict society is very, very polarizing. So we can see different allocations. So where you live essentially can say, um, what religion do you embrace? So that's kind of thing. So one of the things that I would say, you need to be aware of your, uh, your, your tribes. You need to be aware of that you live in a small world. And then second, you need to think about how to make yourself, quote unquote, um, immune against mis disinformation. This is something that we have been dealing these days. And again, mis disinformation is not something new, but we, but we don't really know how to, um, uh, 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 um, to, 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 to tackle that, to counteract them. Maybe looking at what happened in Ambon, what they did, uh, at least a group of people and that I have talked with, they create a, a secret Facebook group where they can coordinate one another to counteract mis disinformation circulating during the conflict. And then ordinary people that I've been speaking, that I was speaking with uh, at cafes uh, uh, on the street, they mentioned that well, if we do not really see it, so it doesn't happen. So that kind of statement say uh, indicate that they have developed a, an, an, an immunity against mis disinformation. But that doesn't happen um, uh, uh, spontaneously. That doesn't happen uh, 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 in one night. It, you know, we don't really. It happened after thousands of people died. We do not want to see that happen. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe one of the things that we can build as a society is by reminding people that if we do not the ability to, again, verify, to counteract the things that we believe not true, we put ourselves at risk to engage in violent conflicts. And when conflict happens, when a conflict happens with a society, it is always the ordinary people who um, who who in the positions of losing. If I were to summarize what you said, uh, there are three things or three steps that can be undertaken to help depolarize a society based on your own research. One is uh, immunization against disinformation, as you pointed out. Second is uh, reconstruction of collective identities. And third is uh, revitalization of third places. Uh, can, can we tackle them one by one? I think they're all very important. I think they're all very potentially, uh, you know, inspiring. Uh, can, can we begin with the third places? You talked about cafes. You talked about your own experience in a, in a cafe and, and, and looking at it as a full chrome of, of an entire society, not limited to just one tribe, quote unquote, or one identity. Can we start with that? What, what does that mean? Uh, what do you mean by saying uh, we need to revitalize our third places and how can we do that? Hmm. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna ask you, when the last time you went to a cafe and had a conversation with strangers in your neighbor uh, or, or your neighbors? Oh, that was just the other day. <laughs> Okay, that's good. That's good. That's great. Um, for the lesson, the reasons why I'm suggesting how to refer, uh, that we need to revitalize our the third places, it is really important for us to know each other better, to know our neighbors, to know to know the people that live next to us. The reason is the people who live next to us, the people that we run into on, on, on our commute, they are actually members of our small world. 
The thing is, when you go to cafes these days, we do not really talk to each other. We probably tend to, uh, you know, uh, uh, surf on the internet and stuff like that. So um, we, we allow ourselves to be disconnected from each other. And the dangers of being disconnected from each other in a daily basis is that we will have more suspicions toward the other small world members. So if, let's say, you become a member of the society of your small world and you try to go to certain cafes where you can run into people probably who share different, different identities, who share different ideologies and have a just small talk in the beginning and then afterward you keep going, um, then finally you can hear different ideas, different ideas, different opinions. This is something that we don't really have on social media because almost every day we are fed by the same information, information that believe are going to amplify our preferences, our interests. But if we interact at a cafe, for example, let's say uh, I have a Muslim name, I have a Muslim name. So, so I challenge myself to go to a cafe that is identical um, with, let's say, Christian uh, visitors. So I would understand, oh, that's that's what you think about why the conflict happened because in the muslim community that i have spoken with different versions of why the conflict happened was told to me so in other words we are trying to deconstruct our own identity and our understanding and the norms the the narratives that have been taught to us within our small world so that is something that I probably an extended versions of why we need to uh, revitalize our our uh, the third places in our neighborhood. Why are they called third places again? So in contrast to home and work. Yeah, it's something that you do like after 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 you go home. That is the first place, and then work in the second mm -hmm. place, and then you have other place, the third place, which is like just cafes, uh, barber shop, and stuff like that. That is something that mm -hmm. that we probably let's put it this way. I'm in Yogyakarta at the moment, um, mm -hmm. so the third places are reviving. People start having conversations at cafes, people from different backgrounds, people from different ethnicities, people from different religions. The case will be different if you go to co-working spaces. If you want to work, you know, talk to other people, you go to co-working spaces. That will happen in Jakarta these days. I've been here for uh, for about five weeks, and then I've been observing cafes um, and, see, um, and see which cafes tend to be more diverse and which cafes tend to be uh, homogeneous. One thing that I would like um, uh, to raise here is that, especially if you are an urban planner or try to design cities, um, going to cafes becoming a lifestyle, but it's going to lead to certain bias. Again, I have to I have to mention it after five weeks here. It's a middle class bias. It's middle class bias, and we need to think about that informations or bad informations or or, or misinformation information do not does not discriminate between classes and socioeconomic status. So when we're looking at cafes as an entry point to, let's say, um, let's say connect people again, um, we also need to expand the understanding to the context of different economic status, not only the, um, the, uh, the, the, the political identities. So, Coffee shops, uh, barber shops, as you said, uh, public parks, and I guess even bowling alleys. I'm reminded of that uh, uh, landmark work uh, by Putnam, was it? Uh, bowling yes. alone. So I, we need to bowl together. I think that's what that's what you're saying uh, to re to revitalize the third places. Another way to depolarize, as you said, was to reconstruct collective identity. What does it mean? What's involved there? It means we are trying to look at um, what connects us. We are trying to um, identify our common grounds, what it is that, um, that unite us. I'm going to give you an example. So uh, 
living in a post-conflict society in Ambon, for example, um, people try to move on from the, the past conflict experience. So what they did was essentially looking at the future. That is the common goal to advance the city after years of conflict. That is one example. The other example was that, can we see ourselves as an Ambonis? That was sort of the sentiment I kept, I kept hearing when I was there. Rather than seeing themselves as a Muslim, as a Christian, they saw themselves as an Ambonis, as part of the bigger world. When they are in the public, they're part of the bigger world. When they're going back home, they're part of the small world. Okay. The criticism was that your identity or you, 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 your expression, something that you share in the public, is it consistent with what you are doing in, at home, in, the, in your small world, for example? Okay, some people will say no, because when you are at home in your small world, you're probably going to be um, bad mouth about your um, Muslim neighbors. When you're in the public, you don't do that. It's, it's, it's something that we need to work on, actually, how to make things consistent, what happened in the public and what happened um, at home. When we are looking at reconstructing our collective identity, it means we are trying to, have, uh, to hold on something that is bigger than our tribe. In this sense, we are thinking about, okay, if you are Filipinos, let's have some Filipino camaraderie. If you are Bonis, then you have to think about, okay, what we can do together for the city. So if we see that sense of camaraderie, then we can think that, oh, okay, you will not exploit my tendency to be tribal. You will not exploit my identity as a Muslim, as a Christian, because I know beyond that, I am an Ambonis, and my responsibility is to make sure that this place, this city, can become a better place for the next generations. So this is sort of the narrative that I heard when I was researching a post-conflict society like Ambon, Indonesia. Where does this reconstruction take place? Does it happen in the media? Does it happen in social media? Does it happen in schools? Does it happen okay, in civic space? Okay, okay, don't hit me because mass media, I'm not, it's not rappler, it's not the other media in Indonesia. Um, they do not really pay attention to that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they like to see things from a different angle. Um, mm -hmm. That is why, um, that is why deconstructing our past experience and then reconstructing our collective identity to build a better future are usually happening at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. At the grassroots level. Of course, we have some state interventions. Of course, that is necessary. But most time, mm -hmm. it started from, uh, from the grassroots. We can see that a group of young people trying to reconnect people from different locations, from, from different religion. Essentially, those who happen to be in adversarial relationships, they try to connect them together. That kind of good things do not really appear on mass media, unfortunately. In this sense, social media plays a good role. Social media become the media that these activists, let's call them peace activists, use to promote depolarization. At, at the level of the grassroots, uh, what happens? Uh, do you, are there, you know, uh, you get together on the badminton court or on the soccer pitch, uh, or no, are there concerts? No. You know, what, what cuts Actually, across the divide? Actually, they don't really talk about the differences. They don't even talk about their, their, their conflict experiences. They just focus on what are the things that they can do together. I'm going to give you an example. A group mm -hmm. of young people from different religions they are interested in producing music. So music become an entry point. So they work together. One is good at playing guitar. The other is good at 
how to know, uh, 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 making video clips and stuff like that, they just work together. Through working together, starting from cafe interactions again, they started realizing that, oh, hold on a second, we know what, we don't really see ourselves as a Muslim or Christian here. We see ourselves as musicians. We see ourselves as Ambonis. We see ourselves as um, a good member of society who is trying, uh, who are trying to do something good for our for, for ourselves and our community. So that's a, that's that's just an example of how reconstructing the collective identity can start from from the grassroots. But again, if we want to extrapolate that kind of example, we need mass media. We need stronger state interventions. Thank you. The uh, third element that you suggested can lead to depolarization is uh, probably top of mind for people like me, you know, uh, journalists, uh, and that is uh, immunization against misinformation and disinformation. Uh, you you chose the word immunization, meaning it's it's like you know they're being vaccinated against uh, uh, the disinformation virus. No? How does this happen? Uh, are they exposed to uh, you know the tactics that disinformation agents use or have they just uh, learned to uh, channel all this information to you know a, a separate venue uh, uh, therefore uh, allowing uh, isolating it uh, from all other venues how does immunization work yeah so what I'm using the word they are immune or they develop an immunity against misinformation and disinformation. It stems from their own experience. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, I was having these conversations with um, a lady who was working at one of the monuments that close to uh, in, uh, one of the monuments um, in the city of Ambon. So I was asking her so uh, a question. So what did you do when the conflict happened? Oh, I was working just like usual. Nothing really changed. Why? Because back then there were so many messages circulating through mobile phone, through SMSs. It was 2011, it was SMSs. Now this WhatsApp. Um, so, well, yeah, I received a few messages back then, but I ignored them simply because I need to see what happened in the city. So she went to work just like normal days. And then in the city that was told there was a conflict, there was a riot, nothing happened. So that kind of immunity we need to have. So in this sense, rather than relying on information shared by others, rather than relying on information uh, we uh, the, see stumble on social media, or rather than relying on information circulated by uh, local media or national media back then, she decided to check the information by herself. So that kind of things develop organically in Ambon. So you will find more stories like that when you take a public transportation, for example, like the mini buses, like, like the mini buses, the shuttle buses, during the conflict, people would say something like, oh, there was a conflict on this street. And then the person who was sitting in the other side of the, uh, uh, of the shuttle buses will say, no, that is just not true because I just went there and what you were saying just wrong. And then when people started to connect, let's say, uh, certain violence with the religions of the perpetrators, people start correcting them. No, that has nothing to do with the religion of the perpetrator, but it has to do with, let's say, they just run. They just, um, they're just, you know, kids or stuff like that. So my point is that in Ambon, it happens because they have seen so many relatives and families died during the conflict. That is why they started developing the ability to verify information independently. So we do not want people in different parts of Indonesia or, uh, or elsewhere 
to think that oh we have to see people die first in order for us to to, to verify information no we don't want that to happen we can learn something uh, from what happened in a post conflict society in a different in, in polarized ambi that we need to again have that kind of tendency to not trust certain uh, 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 certain things that you do you cannot verify You know, I have so many more questions, uh, especially related to disinformation, uh, but we're running long. So let me just ask one last question, Dr. Roman. Um, and I apologize for the sound of the airplane. I'm, I'm in Davao right now and I'm beside near the airport. Uh, very sorry about that. Um, my question has to do with uh, time, timing. Uh, the conflict in Ambon, happened just a few years ago. As you said, thousands died. Um, is there such a thing as too soon? Is there uh, uh, time needed for the communities to heal before you can begin the work of depolarization? What, what did you learn from your field work? Um, okay, so I would say, okay, Okay, we all know that, that media literacy, informational literacy programs are needed, but it is more important to have critical thinking skills to be taught intensively, um, informally or formally. What I mean by critical thinking is that, just like example in Ambon, people do not rely on information they receive from, let's say, their relatives, their families. Usually we get information from our of, or from other members of the small world we belong to, or they rely on social or, or from social media or from mass media. So we were well we can identify, okay, we're gonna really trust this media because it always gives like inaccurate information. That is part of the uh, media literacy skill. But I would say critical thinking skills are crucial to be tied in schools and at home. That's going to give us the ability to ask questions. What happened if I share this information to the other member of my small world? What happened if I share this information on my social media platforms? Who will be benefited from this? What are the ramifications of me sharing this information publicly? So in this sense, we critically assess our decision to share information. That is something that we don't really teach at home to our kids or, or in the schools. I'm teaching uh, students in Vietnam and, and I have taught students in Singapore and the US and, 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 and Indonesia and Vietnam. And in Southeast Asia particularly, it is hard to, to teach critical thinking because we're not allowed to think critically, especially if you live in quote unquote, what was the word again, a strong man leader or strong leader environment <laughs> like Vietnam. It's hard or China. So it is troubling me when my students trust me or believe in every single information I give them. I challenge them to distrust the information I'm giving them. If they can, for example, look for um, or they have rebuttal arguments, if they have competing evidence, I'll be happy to have conversations. And, and, and if you look at, let's say, from uh, at home, they're not allowed to do that. And in schools, the teachers are essentially their parents who do not really teach critical thinking skills. So I don't really know if I can give you a good answer, but I think media literacy or information literacy alone is not sufficient without enabling uh, people in general to think critically. Thank you to Dr. Uh, Abdul Roman of RMIT Vietnam. Many thanks for an illuminating practical and inspiring discussion. Your work helps define the parameters of the public square. Thank you again. 
Thank you so much for having me, John. It is an honor to be here. That's it for us tonight. The next step for engaged citizens is always to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.